I was very, very interested, intrigued, and inspired by an article I read in the LA Times written by two of California's former attorney generals. Democrat John Van de Kamp, former prosecutor in Los Angeles, uh, a, a figure in Pasadena and Los Angeles, absolutely for sure, and state attorney general, the Republican side. And Dan Lundgren, state attorney general on the Republican side, who came together and wrote a very persuasive, interesting article published in the LA Times about removing the dam from Hetch Hetchy. And so I was absolutely overjoyed when I extended an invitation for John to be the kickoff speaker as we think about the centenary after Muir's death. And as UCLA enters its second century, what an auspicious time for us to launch our efforts with the Muir Chair, what an auspicious time for us to think about not just the past hundred years, but the next hundred years. So when John Van de Kamp said that he would come and speak to us today on the Hetch Hetchy, I was, I was overjoyed. I thought it was the perfect way to start this enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, John Van de Kamp. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor, really, to be invited to be here. <coughs> to begin, um, more than any time in history, mankind faces a crossroad. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, and the other to total extinction. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose to choose correctly. The words of Woody Allen. <laughs> and as you go about this conference today, think of correct choices that we have to make. First, we all know that we're in the middle of a drought. Our cities and farms need water. In the past, we've built dams. Uh, one of the most recent is the Diamond Valley Dam out beyond Riverside, built by the Metropolitan Water District. I think some 600,000 plus acre feet are now stored there. And the question is, does it make sense to put more dams on the front burner today? Now, there's a natural place for a new dam. How many of you would support building a dam to harness the Merced River? in Yosemite Valley. How many would do that today? Raise your hands. I don't see anybody. That <laughs> doesn't surprise me. And of course, the fact is that there are more efficient ways of saving water than building dams. And building a dam uh, in Yosemite Valley, I think, boggles the mind. But the fact is, as Glenn said, that 100 years ago, President Woodrow Wilson authorized the building of a reservoir in the northern reaches of Yosemite National Park in the Hetch Hetchy Valley, a valley that parallels Yosemite Valley in beauty. This picture and this picture give you an idea of what it looked like back then. John Muir and more than 200 newspaper editorials nationwide opposed Wilson's signing of the Raker Act in 1914, I believe, which allowed San Francisco to build the dam in the park. Uh, I think it was 1914 to be exact. John Muir wrote in 1903, quote, after my first visit to it in the autumn of 1871, I've always called it the Tuolumne Yosemite, for its wonderfully exact counterpart of the Merced Yosemite, not only in the sublime rocks and waterfalls, but in the gardens, groves, and meadows of its flowing park-like floor. And of course, here's what it looks like today. And so I come here today to argue that Wilson made a big mistake in 1913 when he and Congress succumbed to San Francisco's lobbyist and Interior Secretary Franklin Lane, San Francisco's former city attorney, and that we should do something about it. Now, I, I come here today with a bias. Um, 
Starting at age 10, I went to a little private school in Altadena called the Trail Finders. It was a very unusual place. Um, you get there at 7.30 in the morning, assigned to clean up the grounds, the cactus garden one time. That was not very popular. Uh, but then you'd go inside into the living room of the home of the school, and the headmaster would sit there and read you the newspaper. That was your current events class. Uh, and then for about 25 minutes, classical music. You'd listen to Mozart, Beethoven, Mahler, Brahms, and we'd send cigars to John Sibelius every year on his birthday all the way to Finland. He'd long stop composing by that time. But more important, this group specialized in the outdoors and camping. So every other weekend, we'd go to places here in Southern California, Sespe Creek, up near Mount San Jacinto, near Idlewild. And then in the summer, six-week camping trips, uh, several of which I went to in Tuolumne Meadows and Tenaya Lake, splitting our time between the two places, getting down to Mono Lake, and in other summers going to the Grand Canyon, the Indian country, to Zion, Bryce, and climbing the Grand Tetons. Uh, so conservation and natural resource protection became a part of my life, as did the example that John Muir set with respect to conserving our natural resources. And as Attorney General, I created the environmental section and took on such issues as offshore drilling, Diablo Canyon, the protection of Lake Tahoe, destructive clear-cutting and logging of old-growth sequoias in Sequoia National Forest, and closer to our subject today, help persuade Congress to protect the Tuolumne River from further hydroelectric development by designating it as a wild river. And after I left office, I, I served as the president of the LA Conservation Corps, which today is dedicating some woodlands over in Descanso Gardens of all places, and, and later became the president of the Planning and Conservation League. But what happened in Hetch Hetchy has always bothered me. Uh, and so I've spoken out in recent years, urging that it's time we rectified President Wilson's tragic mistake. And so the article was written in the LA Times along with Dan Lundgren, arguing that it's time for the Hetch Hetchy Valley to be returned to the American people, making Yosemite Park whole once again. That would essentially mean that we should tear down the dam, let time restore the valley to its original state, uh, and that essentially means that as a practical matter, we'd have to make sure that those who benefit from that dam today be made whole by downstream storage outside the park and by taking other measures. Another picture of what this place looks like today. Well, John Muir went to his grave in 1914 here in Los Angeles, grieving that he had lost the fight of his life, as was indicated. What he did not know is that the fight was not totally in vain because in 1916, Congress passed the National Park Service Act to ensure that going forward, national parks would be managed as a national system, not for local benefit. And subsequent proposals to build dams in Yellowstone the Grand Canyon were defeated. Municipalities have not been allowed to appropriate land and other resources from our national parks since then, though there are some efforts once in a while to do just that. And so why haven't we done anything about the Hetch Hetchy Dam? Uh, first, San Franciscans are concerned about losing their water supply. Second. Senator Dianne Feinstein, its former mayor, has long opposed any kind of restoration, and those in Congress from California have not been willing to make this an issue for reasons of their own. In 2012, San Francisco voters were asked to develop a non-binding plan to consider water conservation and other system reforms, as well as the restoration of Hetch Hetchy Valley to return it to its natural state. 
despite numerous studies by governmental agencies, universities, independent groups, which concluded it would be possible to continue to get water from the Tuolumne without storing it in Yosemite, the voters defeated the plan non-binding though it was. And second, there are questions of cost for not only tearing down the dam, but providing new facilities uh, and enlarging it for water storage facilities outside the park. And then third, as a value proposition, is it that important? I mean, that's a question for each one of us to, I think, take to heart. The answer to that is personal. Uh, I doubt that there would be much sentiment today to do what Wilson authorized in 1913. Your show of hands earlier, or lack thereof, I think indicates that. Now, some basic facts. Congress <coughs> preserved Hetch Hetchy Valley in 1890 as part of Yosemite National Park. It lies the western slope of the Sierra Nevada, some 15 miles south of, or north of uh, Yosemite Valley. It is 3,700 feet above sea level. That's about 300 feet lower than Yosemite Valley. The Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, uh, called the O'Shaughnessy Dam, you'll see it really way up in the far right there, uh, named the O'Shaughnessy Dam after Michael O'Shaughnessy, San Francisco's chief engineer, is a key component of the water supply system that serves 2.4 million people in San Francisco's <coughs> Bay Area. The dam holds 360,000 acre feet uh, of water, slightly less than 25% of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission's total storage capacity. I'm going to refer to SFPUC hereafter. About one third of San Francisco's Tuolumne River supply is consumed within the city. The rest is sold to other Bay Area communities. Other districts, for example, the Turlock and Modesto Irrigation District share with SFPUC a portion of the Tuolumne River's flow, not all of which comes from the Hetch Hetchy. They share storage at the Don Pedro Reservoir, which you will see uh, sort of midway uh, in the middle of this particular map, downstream from the Tuolumne that holds six times as much water as the Hetch Hetchy. And this complicates matters because the rights are senior to San Francisco's, that is those irrigation districts. In dry years, SFPUC share of the Tuolumne River cannot meet the demand. Today, SFPUC doesn't filter its Tuolumne River supply. Lows going downstream are likely to have a greater number of constituents which necessitate additional treatment and filtration. So that's an issue. Hydroelectric power. Hetch Hetchy hydropower accounts for a tiny share of California's electricity supply, actually just six-tenths of one percent. That's uh, a drop in the bucket, so to speak. Uh, at last report, it provided about 1.7 million kilowatt hours from three Tuolumne River powerhouses. Removing the dam would result in a reduction of between 20 and 40 percent of that production, so measures would have to be taken and found to make up for the lost energy. Some years ago, the Environmental Defense Fund studied those issues and came up with a cost analysis for replacement of water and power services provided by the dam with cost estimates ranging from 500 million to 1.65 billion. Now, that was 10 years ago. Their figures were based on analysis by a mainstream consulting firm. They excluded the cost of tearing down the dam and building facilities and infrastructure that would accommodate visitors to a restored valley, so it would probably be more than what they had estimated. Meanwhile, the State Department of Water Resources has placed a total cost of restoration at somewhere between three and ten billion dollars, a figure which uh, GEI consultants has said is significantly overstated because it more than replaced existing water supply capacity and did not account for SFPUC's planned improvements. Now I'd like to just 
mention today some of the measures that might be taken to restore water and power service should the dam be torn down. We start with these numbers. Only 5% of SFPUC's water supply would require replacement. Only 20% of the SFPUC's hydropower would require replacement. With respect to water, San Francisco would continue to rely on Tuolumne River water for its majority of its needs, using mainly the existing infrastructure. In winter and spring, natural flow would be diverted as it is today. In summer and fall, system reserves outside would provide enough water for all users while leaving adequate carryover supplies as insurance. Now, presently, San Francisco uses that Don Pedro Reservoir only as a water bank for which it supplies and repays the Turlock and Modesto Irrigation Districts. Assessing that water bank and enlarging it with Hetch Hetchy water will require an intertie, that is, a pipeline connecting the San Joaquin Pipeline to the San Pedro Reservoir. Today, the city has no infrastructure to convey its Don Pedro supplies to the Bay Area or to the Cherry uh, Reservoir uh, stream up, upstream, which you can see up on, towards the right-hand side. Uh, to construct an intertie between the Don Pedro Reservoir and the SFPUC's conveyance system would require an agreement with the Turlock and Modesto Irrigation Districts. That could take care of San Francisco in all but the driest years. In the driest years, the SFPUC would also draw Tuolumne River water stored off stream in its Calaveras Reservoir, which you'll see more on the left side of this particular map. That reservoir would have to be expanded. Now, San Francisco is already investigating uh, expanding that reservoir and some of the other Bay Area <coughs> reservoirs, which you'll see as you look particularly towards the south end uh, of, the, of the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. Well, uh, it's important, I think, to understand that uh, there are other options available, which include groundwater exchange with neighboring water districts and dry year purchases from irrigation districts. Important to understand that other water agencies in California have modified their systems in recent years to accommodate natural resource restoration. For example, in Mono Lake, below the eastern side of the Sierra, where Los Angeles diversions from the streams feeding Mono Lake have been limited by the State Water Resources Board. And then on the Trinity River, where diversions were reduced to restore salmon populations that have sustained local Indian tribes for close to a thousand years. Cities have modified their system in ways that greatly outweigh what San Francisco would have to do here. Safe water. An EDF consultant found that with the addition of existing water treatment technologies downstream, the water would be comparable or superior to the water in the present Hetch Hetchy system. San Francisco is already planning expansion of their sun oil treatment plant which filters and disinfects supplies at the local reservoirs. In its study, San Francisco was envisioning that its entire water supply would be conventionally treated, including filtration. Indeed, the EPA may require the city to filter its entire supply, and that would include Hetch Hetchies, and if that happens, there would be no added safe water costs coming from the demolition of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Hydropower. Several options are available there to replace or eliminate the need for the lost energy, which I described earlier. Demand side measures, such as increased investment in energy efficiency and the expansion of dynamic pricing programs, would help. Uh, our mayor here in Los Angeles has just announced a major effort to reduce our, our energy requirements here. New supplies could be obtained by purchasing power from or constructing new generating facilities and renewable energy, especially wind and power, uh, wind and solar power, are the greenest new supply side resources. And then too, there are gas-fired plants that are highly efficient. More than 20 of those 
plants with a typical capacity of 500 megawatts entered service in California between 2001-2006. Just one such plant would replace all of the foregone energy from Hetch Hetchy, some 690 megawatts. Indeed, by 2020, state laws here in California mandate that at least 33% of California's electric power must come from renewable resources. Hydro is not included in that. And that means regardless of what happens to Hetch Hetchy, there will continue to be new investments in renewable energy resources. And last and not least, uh, there are financing and legal issues to be resolved. The most obvious solution is for Congress to amend the Raker Act to authorize an altered set of purposes. Clearly, a variety of funding sources would have to be developed. Most obvious, the state and federal governments would have to finance, I think, most of the restoration, which would take place over time. It's not going to be a one-year budget item and then go away. It would have to be done probably over a number of years. The state of California would have to negotiate and affirm San Francisco's diversion and water rights, assuring the Turlock and Modesto irrigation districts and others that they'll be protected. Those entities will have to be involved in the negotiation and help produce new arrangements responding to the legitimate power and water demands of all. So Dan Lundgren and I proposed very simply a beginning of a process. First, the establishment of a bipartisan effort in Congress to consider amendments to the Raker Act that would stop the use of Hetch Hetchy as a municipal reservoir. And second, the commission of an independent analysis uh, of practical alternatives and the actual cost of restoration and how that cost would be allocated. Just to get started will be time consuming. And then one month ask, you know, how long would it take to get the restoration completed? I would say at the top of my head, something like 10 years. It sounds like a long time. Well, what would it look like after restoration? The National Park Service produced a report that gives us an idea of the time involved once the dam is removed. They concluded that the valley would rebound over time. Within five years, mammals and amphibians and reptiles endemic to the area would return. After 10 years, uh, willow thickets, meadows, and conifer groves would begin to resume their original pattern. Families visiting the valley every so often would watch uh, restoration taking place. And after 50 years, the valley would begin to appear as it once did, and the bathtub ring on the valley's walls would begin to fade away. And as the next century, as the forest matured, the Hetch Hetchy Valley would recover its natural glory. John Muir wrote in 1903, the making of gardens and parks goes on with civilizations all over the world and increase in size and number as their value is recognized. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, for nature may heal and cheer and give strength to body and soul alike. There's no quick fix uh, for the Hetch Hetchy, no instant gratification uh, for whatever we do. Complete restoration and rebound will not take place until, I think, after many of us are gone. But I, I say today to you, it's time to start while we're alive. Albert Camus wrote, don't wait for the judgment day, the last judgment, it takes place every day. Nearly everyone I've known in public life when asked uh, why they bother to be in public life answers, I'd like to leave this place a better place. It oftentimes like, looks like a Sisyphean task. But I say to the President of the United States, you just made our San Gabriel Mountains a national monument. Before you leave office, get the ball rolling to restore Hetch Hetchy. And I say to our governor, You'd like to leave your bullet train as your legacy. At least that's the indication. 
Restoring Hetch Hetchy is a far better legacy, and you can help by using some of your water bond money the people have granted you to expand surface and groundwater storage that helps us tear down the dam by protecting Bay Area water interest. William Faulkner uh, said this when he accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature. He said, the greatest privilege in life is to help others endure by lifting up their heart, restoring that beautiful valley where once again people can play in and pray in will do just that. Thank you very much.